I'm here in northern Minnesota, uh, north of uh, Park Rapids at Rick's Aviation Adventures, and we're here today to talk to Rick Marcil. You might see some of the resemblance. He's actually my brother, and he's hosting us for the weekend, but he has a very interesting business. It's kind of a unique business, an aviation business, and you can see the float plane. And Rick, can you tell me what, what goes on at Rick's Aviation Adventures here in, uh, in Minnesota? Yeah, well, Steve, um, what I do is I, I have a, a small aviation instructional business and um, I'm, I'm retired from my normal job, but I've been teaching for aviation for over 43 years. And um, I teach individuals uh, how to fly float planes. And uh, I also do some tailwheel instruction, but during the summertime, as you can see, the, the airplane gets on floats. And, and uh, so I spend my weekends giving instructional lessons to pilots who want to add a certificate onto their, uh, their existing commercial certificate or private certificate. So, so if you're a pilot and want to add on to your certificate for a float plane, uh, what's the process that they have to go through to be able yeah. to get that certificate? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, the, the people that come to me either have a private pilot's license or a commercial pilot's license. And the FAA require uh, a course, a curriculum that um, has so many hours and so many maneuvers and procedures that are required to be tested by an FAA examiner. Uh, and as a licensed FAA instructor, I give those lessons and then I sign those students off at the end of the lessons. And uh, I have a FAA examiner who comes out lands his airplane here actually uh, at our little Sky Manor Aero Estates airstrip and um, he, he provides the testing to the students and that's usually done on a Sunday. So my course lasts from Thursday through Saturday and then we test Sunday. And then this, and of course the star of the, of the education is the plane. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me a little bit about the plane and yeah. what kind of plane in your it yeah. is and where you got that plane. Yeah, well the airplane is um, a 1957 Piper Super Cub. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's called a PA-18A. And A actually stands for agriculture. So when the airplane was built out of the factory in 1957, it was actually a spray plane. Um, and during its lifetime, it was converted to a two-seater. And, um, and then it was converted to a float plane. And I purchased the airplane from a retired airline captain out of uh, Bellingham, Washington, and I flew it home uh, about five years ago. And um, since then, you know, that's when Rick's Aviation Adventures was established and, and uh, we built the educational outpost. You know, if it wasn't for Rosa, I mean, I was, I was gonna put up a, just a stick built little hangar and she said, no, we're gonna do this right. You know, this is a yep. beautiful setting and you know, it's a field of dreams and it's a dream of mine. And, we just uh, we just looked at our life and we said, hey, you know, what are you, what are you living for? You know, sure. you know, you can't take it with you, sort of thing. So follow your heart. Yeah, and, and uh, listen to your wife. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't be afraid to bootstrap it once in a while. Yeah, great. So typically, a student uh, a student would come here on a Thursday and stay here at the hangar. You've got facilities for them to stay, mm -hmm. and then they would go through the the ground school and the flight instructions over. Friday, Saturday, and then, and then Sunday the, the yeah. uh, FAA person comes out and they yeah. do their certification yep. test. Yep, so I have a, I have a curriculum. Uh, you know, in a previous life, I was a, a director of training at the University of North Dakota back in the 80s and 90s. And I did a lot of curriculum development um, for the university. So my small curriculum, or short curriculum, I should say, uh, for the seaplane rating is uh, about six hours long uh, of flying time. And then I have uh, um, several uh, texts that I have the students read and go through. And then I have uh, about 100 questions, um, oral questions that I have written out for them to study because there's an oral exam that the FAA examiner is gonna give them, which lasts about an hour. And then if they pass the oral exam, it's aeronautical knowledge of seaplaning. Um, then the examiner decides whether um, they're competent to go flying or not. And if they pass the oral, then they'll go up for the, the flight. And my flight course is about six hours. So we fly typically about two hours a day. So Thursday, two hours, Friday, two hours, Saturday, two hours. 
Uh, if we need more time, we'll take more time, but that gives them time to study. It also gives them time to go and see the area. There's, there's a lot to see around the area. So, so, so one, of the, one of the unique features of this area is, is I like to say it's the land of sky blue waters, lots of little lakes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know that's one of the advantages for the flight training is you have lots of different lakes that you can land in. And can you talk a little bit about yeah. some of the lakes? And yeah, that's, that's, that's a wonderful question. It, there's, I'm, in, I'm located in Hubbard County, Minnesota, and there's over 200 lakes in Hubbard County. I can't land on all of them because some of them are so small. I, you know, I, I can land on them, but I can't get out of them mm -hmm. you know, with the airplane. So there's some performance restrictions you know, that the aircraft has, um, but it, it makes it really nice. I, I leave here, the grass strip, you'll notice the airplane has wheels on it as well. It's, it's considered an, an amphibious uh, float plane. So I take off, off the grass strip here, and as soon as I take off, I'm over a lake. Uh, Island Lake is, is located right here. And uh, then it's Eagle Lake, Potato Lake, um, Big Sand Lake. I do a lot of work on Big Sand. It's a very big, larger lake. Um, there's a, um, a requirement that I institute in my training, and it's, and it's about etiquette, float plane etiquette. And one of the float plane etiquette issues is making too much noise in a serene environment like mm -hmm. the cabins and things sure. like that. So we, uh, we go to a lot of different lakes rather than staying on one lake because I don't want to become a nuisance to any of the cabin owners. Um, and, and then I would imagine because you have such a wide variety of lakes, then you can, you can give them the experience on a bigger lake where maybe there's more wind a little bit. Oh, absolutely. And so they, yeah. they have to land in something that's a little bit different yeah. condition than on a, more, a smaller lake maybe that's more enclosed. Right. The curriculum requires me to, um, to train them in confined uh, area operations, so a smaller confined lake. Um, that takes a different technique to land in and to take off in. It also requires me to train them in a glassy water environment where the wind is very calm and the water's uh, like glass, so you have a problem with depth perception as you're coming down mm -hmm. under the water. So that requires me to have a very long lake um, because we come down at a very shallow angle and actually fly the airplane onto the water. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I have crosswind takeoff mm -hmm. and landing requirement. Um, I have rough water landing requirement. So if it's like today, the wind's not too strong, but I'd have to go to a bigger lake where the waves are more pronounced, yep. you know, to, to find a rough water scenario to yep. be able to incorporate that into the training. Now, I know that you also have uh, skis for the plane. Yeah. Because I've seen, you've seen yep. you use it in the winter. So if you get rated for a float, is it a different rating for skis? Yeah, the ski, the ski plane doesn't, the FAA doesn't require a, an instructor sign off or an endorsement, and that's what I give, uh, into the logbook for ski flying. So if you want to learn how to fly skis, I'll, I can teach you the ins and outs of ski flying, but there is no endorsement that's required. So theoretically, how I learned is I just taught myself. I didn't have to have a, an endorsement from another instructor. Mm -hmm. um, and I do get some people who call up and want, to, you know, want ski flying as well. Sure. Um, that's a little bit more difficult uh, in the sense that the snow conditions have to be just about perfect yeah, in yeah. order for us to do that. Now, you mentioned that the, the plane uh, was designed for ag spraying originally, yeah. and I know that you started your career in ag spraying. Yeah, so can you tell me a little bit about w what uh, motivated you in the first place to become yeah. a pilot and get into ag flying? And, <laughs> and, and, yeah. uh, and then I'll, I'll ask some follow-up questions yeah. about your aviation career. Well. To anybody who's listening, you know, I was, uh, uh, my high school, uh, you know, career was uh, one of, um, let's just say I, I probably wasn't, you know, you, the best student in the class. I wasn't the class valedictorian by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> you were an adventurer. I was an adventurer. <laughs> and, uh, and, and aviation came into my life uh, at, a, at a very opportune time for me because it was, it was what I needed at the time, you know, in terms of, you know, judgment, decision making, uh, and, and, and the skills that I was lacking, um, aviation introduced me to, and I, and I understood it through aviation. And so in 19, 
mid mid 1970s I started flying and um, so there were times when I was learning how to fly that it was difficult I mean it didn't just come natural for me nothing academically has come natural for me um, and aviation has uh, a lot of science and math and um, you know you have to you have to be fairly intelligent to fly an aircraft um, and there were times when I struggled with that and um, back in previous times before we had GPS we had uh, instrumentation um, that was quite difficult to to interpret sometimes when you're flying in the clouds and things like that and I remember one time I I was struggling with uh, non-directional beacon approaches they're called and um, and I was uh, my instructor would yell at me a lot and um, we'd go up flying and I'd shoot these approaches and I'd screw them up and I'd shoot the approaches and I'd screw them up and I went home one time I was living in the basement of my older sister's home um, in Crookston Minnesota and uh, I told her I was gonna quit and um, she knew that if I quit that I would go back to my kind of renegade sort of ways and so she told me in in just a few words uh, that I wasn't gonna quit you know and that I was gonna keep doing this and uh, so I you know, if I needed, if I wanted a place to live, I needed to keep flying, and uh, that was basically it. And um, so, I I continued to try to figure out that NDB approach. And uh, my instructor Brian Hopper, um, who's still flying today and still a wonderful teacher, he uh, he had the patience to keep working with me, and um, we got through the NDB approaches. And um, now there's now they're all decommissioned and I don't have to worry about them anymore. <laughs> so, but it's, a, you know, but it's I outlasted the damn NDB approaches. But the lesson really is perse perseverance. Oh right? yeah, absolutely. You know, you, get, you know, you've got this dream. Oh yeah. You're following it. There's going to be highs and lows, yeah. and you got to just keep with it. You know? Oh yeah. And, yeah. and you'll get to the other side. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's there's lots of highs and lows in you know in anybody's entrepreneurial journey, yeah. and you know you. You know, if you don't have the that core, you know, willingness to to work hard and 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 put up with a few of those disappointments, um, you know, it's not for you. Yeah, great. You know? When we talk about work ethic, you know, I, I think that anybody can develop work ethic. I mean, I, I'm inherently a lazy person until I find a, something I'm passionate about. And so, you know, when I think about all the entrepreneurs out there that are trying new adventures and new things, if you're passionate about it, you, you will find a level of work ethic that you never thought you had. Mm -hmm. um, but if, it's, if, it, if it doesn't drive you from within, you get tired. Yeah. And, you know, once you recognize that you're getting tired, that's a, to me, that's a signal that you're not in the right spot. And so, you know, I don't think work, work ethic is, you know, inherently innate to the individual. I think work ethic is something that gets developed through your passion. And I was just so fortunate that aviation became a passion. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that even though it was difficult academically for me, uh, I was so passionate about it that I, you know, you I did what you could. Yeah, I, I did what get, I had to. Yeah, to get through know, the yeah. academic part. It wasn't what I could. Could wasn't good enough. Yeah. You know, it, it was had to. Yeah. And so I knew I had to do it. And um, and I was supported along the way with some really, really smart people um, that recognized my ability and my intelligence you know um through my work ethic yep. and you know and they fostered that and that's what that's how i really blossomed and i was able to become what i think it is you know a, a great teacher you know to give the to give a wonderful experience to my students good story yeah
longer. So where did you go? Where did you learn to yep, fly, I, and what was it? Yep, what was I, the I procedure? started flying at the University of North Dakota. Um, I received my private pilot's license there. Um, then I wanted to continue flying that summer, but I couldn't get into the courses, so I transferred to the University of Minnesota Crookston, and that's where I found that they had an agricultural aviation program, and that connected with me real well. So I went through their program for a year, got my commercial license, and I was offered a crop spraying job right away. So I never finished college. Um, I never you know, went back and got my degree. But ironically, after my first year of spraying, the University of Minnesota hired me as an instructor. Mm -hmm. And so I taught at the University of Minnesota for um, almost 10 years. And then the University of North Dakota's aviation program hired me. And I, I, I got into curriculum development. And, and really, my, my aviation career took off. Um, I became good friends with the dean, uh, John Odegaard, uh, who founded the college there, the aviation program. And um, at that time, we were just uh, developing a program for China Airlines, mm -hmm. Sadia Air, Gulf Air, uh, an ab initio training program. And I was on the ground floor of that, working with Northwest Airlines, um, the University of North Dakota, and, um, and, and some other consortium members to create a curriculum, and I was the curriculum developer. So University of North Dakota Aviation is one of the larger programs yeah, in the United States, and it was a very growing program at that time. Yeah, right? they, yeah. in fact, they just announced, like last week, they, they flew, uh, they, they're on track to fly over 150,000 hours this year yeah. you know, now, of training. So, I mean, and I was the director of training back in the 90s for them. So, so when, you were, when you were director of training uh, and they were growing, uh, your job was then uh, to be ahead of all the flight instructors, yeah. mm -hmm. and then and then also the the program was growing and becoming international. And so, what was your role in helping them grow their international component? Yeah, so we had two really two directors of training. I was the director of training of the international program. So, f fortunately for me, um, I was able to you know, partake in, in a lot of travel. So I went to Taiwan many times um, because that's where China Airlines was located, um, to Gulf Air, to Bahrain, um, to Oman. Um, we worked with Air France. Um, uh, we worked with um, Aramco, which is the largest oil company in the world, uh, Saudi Arabian Aramco. And so we trained their pilots and they had a facility in Mastra Khalin a simulator facility, so I spent time in Maastricht Hall, and after we trained them in North Dakota, I would then go to Maastricht and put them in the simulator uh, with their chief pilot to see if they passed the mustard, so to speak. Yeah. And if they didn't, their chief pilot, you know, got on me, and then I had to, you know, spend some time with the students and get them back on track. So. So in the course of that time frame. Uh, how many different kinds of uh, planes were you certified to fly? Because I know that you've, yeah. you've flown um, a lot of different planes. Well, you know, it, it was, uh, it's unique because, I, as I mentioned earlier, I started as a crop sprayer. And um, my first experience as a crop sprayer, about six weeks into it, I flew the airplane into the ground. So I totaled that airplane out. Um, now, isn't there a saying that you haven't learned to fly until you crash the plane? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't. I haven't heard that saying. I, you know, but um, there's those that have and those that will. You know. <laughs> so uh, in the crop spraying world, anyway. I was hired in March um, by a local applicator, and uh, he was rebuilding an airplane that had been wrecked the previous year, and so I went down and. Uh, bucked rivets and uh, helped rebuild the airplane. And that was the airplane that I was gonna get to fly that summer. And uh, so we started, I started flying it uh, probably in May and it turned out to be a real busy season and probably more busy than even the uh, owner of the aircraft wanted it to be because it's not a, a good way for a new guy to learn. Um, you wanna take it slow. And um, we got real busy, and I was putting in real long days. But unfortunately, um, and long days are like twelve-hour days. Or something. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen-hour yeah, days. Flying I mean, a plane. Flying a plane. In yeah. and out of tack time. 
yeah. down to the ground yeah. level and up. And yeah, Yank, we call it yanking and banking. And, yeah. um, and so, and, and the problem I had at that time as a 20 year old was I had dollar signs in my eyes. And uh, what I mean by that is every pass was three acres and I made 50 cents an acre. So I made a buck 50 every pass. So I could calculate in my head, in my turns, how much I was making on that field. And, and then I'd go back and fill up and do another field. Well, I was in one of my turns and I wasn't paying attention. And uh, unfortunately, I, I lost uh, airspeed, altitude, and ideas all at the same time. And I hit the ground and uh, totaled the airplane out. Um, the engine separated from the aircraft, the wing separated from the aircraft, and uh, there I sat in the cage um, thinking to myself, I just screwed the pooch. And, uh, <laughs> and so... Did you, know, you get hurt? Um, I didn't get hurt. My ego got hurt, uh, but I did walk away from the crash. Um, but unfortunately, the next day, I also had to walk away from my dream of flying because I was fired. And, uh, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do at that point, but uh, fortunately for me, the University of Minnesota Crookston offered me an instruction job that fall. And the next spring, I uh, was told to go to this small grass airstrip. There was a guy there that had an airplane, and I arrived at his airstrip, and he had a a payloader and a come along hooked up to his motor mount and he was straightening his motor mount because he had hit a tree on landing <laughs> and he said he didn't want to fly the airplane anymore and if it flew straight I could fly it and so I flew it and um, I had a I put 400 hours on that summer and busted my butt and got back into the saddle and um, yeah, yeah. you know had a great career yep you know spraying after that for just about 20 seasons so so don't give up when, yeah. when you have adversity. Yeah, don't give up. You know, I mean, there's always a bump in the road. Yep. But I flew many crop spraying type aircraft. Um, you know, and it just, every year they got a little bigger and a little faster and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and they could haul more, you know, more of a load. And, and uh, so we called the money handle is the spray handle. And, you know, the bigger the load, the, the, the more I'd make. So, you know, I just kept flying as I could. But uh, when I went to the University of North Dakota, things changed a lot for me because I uh, was able to get into multi-engine flying, um, flew their King Airs, which were turboprop corporate aircraft. We trained in those. Uh, we also had um, Cessna Citation jet that I was typed in, um, and then also uh, beach jets, um, which we, I was typed in. And uh, so I trained in the beach jet as well. So um, everything from you know high performance jet aircraft down to um, aerobatic, um, a French built Cap 10 that I actually picked up in Long Island, New York and flew it back. And that was our first aerobatic aircraft. And I trained, I gave aerobatic instruction as well. Oh, yeah, and then um, how long were you at the university? Um, I started there in 87 and I, left in 96 to go fly an Airbus A320 for a Irish registered company. Uh, they had six airplanes here in the States. And so basically you started with a plane like this, yeah. and then you ended up flying the uh, jumbo jet, well, I yeah. call them jumbo jets, yeah, passenger Airbus, yeah. Airbus kind of things, that's mm -hmm. great. And uh, a totally different experience. Yeah, uh, totally different. Yeah, yeah. but you, yeah. you- And I'm back to this, so it's yeah. full circle. You like the seated pants. Yeah, absolutely, fine. yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, and so, do, you know, my, my students like it too, you know, it's, yep. it's, it's aviation has this uh, unique um, draw back to your roots that sure. you always seem to come back to. And, um, and that's what this experience is about is, is offering that, that, you know, fundamental core experience. So tell me a little bit about what uh, kind of your, when you have uh, people that come here to learn how mm -hmm. to get licensed for the full plane, a little bit of your approach to education, your flat field education uh, yeah. in general uh, about yeah. aviation. Yeah, well, it, that, and that's, I'm glad you asked me that question because several of my students that come to me are actually other flight instructors. 
And so the first thing I talk to them about is the difference between being an instructor and being a teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, in the instructing world, uh, especially aviation, everything's very cut and dried. And if you, you know, the, if you do exactly what's on the checklist, this is the result. You know, and so a lot of instructing is done the same way. If you do it over and over and over again the same way, I'm hoping that the, the next time you'll do it the same way automatically. I believe in teaching and the way I frame my teaching up is I'm not teaching you how to fly, I'm teaching you how to think because you already know how to fly. And so I teach them how to think about correlating, which is the highest level of learning, correlating what they already know to a new experience. Mm -hmm. And so reaching in their bag of experience and pulling something out that is relatable to what they're trying to learn in the flow plane. Mm -hmm. And so if I can get them to that correlation level of learning and get them to be thinking instead of, you know, um, reacting, mm -hmm. then I've accomplished what I'm trying to do as a, as a teacher. It sounds like that method would prepare them for the, uh, uh, to react in unexpected situations Absol because they, you've, you've created a, an understanding based on all that experience yeah. that they can apply to that specific situation yeah. right well, then Well, you there. know, you use the word understanding. There's four levels of learning, you know, rote, you know, understanding, application, and correlation. Yeah. And so, you know, if, you know, if I get them to understanding, if I get them to that level, I only have one more to go to get them to correlation. Yeah. And yeah. so you know that's how i think about teaching Great. and that's so when i'm sitting in the back seat of the airplane where i can't see anything you know i have no instrumentation or i don't i can't see what they're what they're doing and what they're touching or you know so um so i have to do it all by sense and feel mm -hmm. and uh you know so if if i sense and feel that they're taking it to the next level that's that's where i'm trying to get them so uh, in terms of the People that typically come here to take your course uh, kind of describe uh, who those might be, sort of the, yeah. the audience that you service. You know, I, I would say you know if you if you balance it on two hands, it's it's I have the the college student who's learning how to fly at a at a university setting mm -hmm. uh, because of the University of North Dakota is 200 miles away. I get a lot of UND students, um, so I I get that. 25 year old college student or 20 year old college student who wants to come down for the weekend with a buddy and stay at the hangar and you know learn how to pound out a rating yeah. you know it's a lot of fun yeah. and uh you know and they hang out cook and drink a few beers at night and do you know study and you know it's a it's a neat setting and then i get um you know <coughs> excuse me older folks who have always wanted a seaplane rating but never got it it's kind of a bucket list item for mm -hmm. them and they're uh, aviation enthusiasts, I call them. Uh, they might have their own airplane or they might be thinking of getting a float plane, but they have to get rated first. Um, and, and so I get some of those as well. I mean, I've had some really interesting people from Texas, uh, Oregon, New York, uh, all come to Rick's Aviation Adventures in the educational outpost. So you've been, you've been doing this a long time. Uh, tell me in your career, uh, what advice did someone give you that you thought was really good advice, but you didn't follow that advice, and why didn't you follow it? And then the subsequent question will be, what adv really good advice did someone give you that you followed and you, and you would recommend other people to follow? Uh, I, th I think I have the same answer for the both questions. Okay. Um, I, our, our dad grew up next to a, a Navy fighter pilot, uh, yeah. and and um, and I was probably 16 years old at the time, and I was uh, chasing his niece around a little bit, and um, and I think he had you know he had that figured out, but um, <laughs> he he knew I was uh, you know at that stage of my life kind of a renegade, and um, he talked to me about his flying experience in the Navy, and. Um, and, and he was a uh, he was a wonderful. He still is a wonderful guy. What's his name? Gary Ness. Yes. Yeah. G Gary Ness is someone who's been following the ride. Oh yeah, terrific. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, so Gary was uh, instrumental in, and the advice that he gave me was, you know, to, to follow your heart and, you know, but I didn't listen to him right, on, right out of the gate, you know. It took me a few years to realize what he was telling me. And then when I realized it was about aviation and, you know, and that, and that discipline and that structure and, and, and what aviation could do, uh, once I connected that dot, it, 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 you know. And so if there was somebody who was instrumental in my life, um, I would have to say it was Gary. Um, Telling you to follow your heart. Yeah. So absolutely. that was good advice that you followed. What yeah. was good advice you didn't follow? Good advice I didn't follow. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I'll have to pass on that one for a while. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, it's, it's been, a, 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 of course, a pleasure interviewing yeah, my thanks, brother, Steve. Rick. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I've always enjoyed... Good luck on your bike ride. Yeah, thanks. And I've always enjoyed uh, observing uh, his uh, aviation career. He's a, he is a great pilot and a great teacher. I know that from others, not just, uh, just because he's my brother. And it's a wonderful location you have here for people. It's a great experience when people come up. I know a few people who have experience your education yeah. and it's a it's a good opportunity where you can come and enjoy yourself for a weekend and really learn something and and enjoy really the the north woods sky blue water kind yeah. of environment yeah. uh, even do a little fishing if you yeah. want so thank you bro yeah thank you yeah